early days, it was like a lot of cold emails. And I was like cold emailing everyone I knew. Um, I was lucky that I had the blog and like that influencer a little like in into that community because I was able to get a lot of that talent in the door easily because I knew them. Um, and I remember like one of the first big gets that we had was at our Chicago conference, Garant Dore, who's like a big blogger, like old school. And I like had emailed her team so many times and like finally she said yes. But I think what we were able to do was we, our approach was a few different things. One was we were approaching celebrities, which at the time was very novel as like entrepreneurs, not just celebrities, right? Like we were really approaching it as like, this is an entrepreneurial conference. Like this is not a fan conference. Like these are women who want advice in that way. And again, this was like 2015, 16. And like, no one had really looked at celebrities in that light, but they were all trying to get into that world. So it was kind of a really good time to, to have that positioning. And two, we provided a really white glove experience because we obviously couldn't afford to pay people. So we were like, we will, you know, set up a pop-up shop for you. We will like, you know, make sure that you have like good press on site. Like we'll make sure like your experience is really seamless and that you're getting as much out of this as we're getting as uh, out as much as having you here. And really like the way I say it's like, it only takes one big name to waterfall into other names. And that big name for us was Jessica Alba. We had been chatting. Honest Company had reached out to us to sponsor. And this was 2017. And we were like, great, amazing. Like, I was so excited. They were like such a cool brand. Um, and their team, you know, we're going through all the logistics and things like that. And their team was like, what do you think about having like Jessica speak? And we're like, uh, yeah, like we're on board. Like we are in, we will make this happen. And I was just like blown away by that, which was so exciting. And then essentially from that, I was able to go to like Rachel Zoe's team. And I was like, Hey, Jessica Alba speaking. And, and I had had a relationship with Rachel through my previous company. And she was like, Oh, amazing. Like, I know Jessica, I know you, this feels like a, a good thing. Rachel spoke. And then Rachel was like, oh, my friend Jen Meyer should speak. And like Jen Meyer was like interviewing her. And then randomly, like one of my friends was like, oh, I am connected to, um, you know, uh, Nicole Richie. Like it all kind of spiraled from there because they had a good experience on site where they were like, we're seeing a return on our, you know, kind of investment in speaking. And therefore that world is very small in the same way the influencer world is small in the same world way the marketing world is small. And people were like, it's a really good experience. And like, we got a lot out of it. And so that was how we were able to keep that momentum going. And like from that time, obviously so much has changed because after like, I would say the first two years, it was like, I couldn't even believe the people we were getting to speak. Like it was so insane. Like an every, and it was always me like negotiating on my own, like, hi, like I really, and like literally battling agents who like did not want their clients to do this, like being like, no, she needs to do this. Like, and basically then it got to the point of saturation where there were so many places for celebrities to speak that became the new norm. And then like it changed, you know? So we were lucky because again, we were first to market and creating that type of experience. So amazing. Yeah. When I first came to create and cultivate, I saw Jessica Simpson speak and that was so huge for me because I always loved her and admired her so much. Um, I was just blown away. A good example of the Jessica Simpson story. So Jessica Simpson's brand was a client at my first company. Like, so the company that owned her brand, like we worked with them. We did like, we did influencer campaigns for Jessica Simpson. And I like obviously kept that email. And then afterwards when I, I like, I had emailed her team for four years probably and been like, just checking in Would love Jessica, would love Jessica. And then basically finally they're like, she has a book and like, she has something to talk about, you know, like, cause they really wanted, obviously she's had her billion dollar business forever, but they're like, she wants something yeah. to like stand on, which makes sense. And we made it happen. And it was like, I had been in touch with that team for five years before that happened. I had been emailing Martha Stewart's team for like at least seven years. <laughs> like, wow. And just had followed up, followed up, followed up. Cause it's all about the timing, you know? So mm-hmm. it really is one of those things where like, just keep following up and like be persistent and like, it'll happen at the right time. Beautiful. So that leads me to my next question. So we've described a lot of the successes, you know, the bright, shiny stuff that was working well, that people were attracted to. We all know behind the scenes as a business owner, you're doing so much. There's burnout, there's stress, there's follow-ups for seven years. So talk to us a little bit about your decision to eventually sell, create and cultivate. And what was the reason for that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, for us being a self-funded business, like the a high growth self-funded business, like the natural trajectory is either to go raise money or sell. And we were in a position where we didn't necessarily need money, but we did need a larger org to absorb us to get to that next level and provide sort of that larger um, framework that we would need to grow and build. And we had built something that was really unique and that was really complementary to a lot of different businesses.